probably good to, to get started. Um, and just so everybody knows, um, this event is being recorded. It should take probably around 30 or 40 minutes. Um, we are very appreciative that, that you all um, gave up some free time to be able to, to join us tonight. Um, but before I go any further, I will let Dr. Zaleski uh, introduce himself. Welcome everybody. I'm, I'm Tom Zaleski, I'm faculty at Bloomsburg. Uh, I'm a full professor. I am also the graduate coordinator for the audiology program. I've been here 24 years, um, so a long time. Um, I was here when the AUD program started. Um, I helped develop the program or, or write some of the courses. Um, so I've seen the transition from the master's to the doctoral programs and see it evolve and grow. So um, as, as Tom had said, uh, welcome everyone. We, we greatly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to come here and, and listen to us and, and get some information on the program. Um, I, I will ask if you do have any questions uh, as we go along. Um, I am someone who, who pretty much likes interaction, so don't hesitate to um, pop in a question in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, and we can answer those for you as best we can. So welcome again. And so I hope uh, this answers your questions and, and meets your needs. And hopefully by the time we're done, you're saying, yep, I want to come to the, the Bloomsburg Audiology Program. You got it. Yep. And hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tom Crash. I'm the director of enrollment communications and in, in graduate admissions. Um, I'll be monitoring the q and I probably don't have as much subject matter knowledge, uh, but the chat is disabled. Thank you, Santina, for telling me here. Let me make sure that is up and running. Okay, that should be working now. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Zaleski. Okay, so, so let's get started here. All right, so uh, here's what we're gonna do tonight. Uh, we're gonna talk about, give you an overview of the audiology program. And then we're also gonna talk about the interoperative neuro, um, neurophysiological monitoring program. Um, they, that's a separate track in the audiology program um, that is available to the audiology students. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then Tom will probably take over and talk about admissions and fin financial aid. And then um, if anyone has uh, any questions or additional questions or comments or concerns uh, at the end, uh, we can open it up for as many questions and comments as you guys want. But as I had said, um, you know, throughout the, the chats or throughout the presentation, please don't hesitate to throw some in. Whoops, I'm playing around with my things here and it's going around too far. All right, so. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions as we go along. All right, so again, welcome everybody. Um, so basically the, the Doctor of Audiology program is uh, really placed on giving you practical clinical training. Um, to my, I'm a firm believer that in order to uh, do well in this field or any field, uh, you have to have a sound theoretical background. Um, to build on, to grow on, and, and to do what you need to do. And if you don't understand, uh, have that theory to be thinking about uh, and know how to base your, your decisions on, that's where problems arise. So uh, the nice thing about our program, you'll get that theory and uh, there's a big uh, emphasis on clinical training, right? Uh, so that's really important at least in my opinion. So a lot of people often ask, um, you know, what's, what's the job like? Am I gonna be able to have a job when I get out? Uh, there is a, a really good market uh, for audiologists. Um, you know, one of the things you gotta keep in mind is, you know, when, when you're walking down the street and you hear those people, uh, when you can hear their earbuds and you're 10, 15, 20 feet away, you know, that's job security. Uh, so, so you don't have to worry about that. Eventually they will be coming to see you or they're in their car and you need your car and your windows are up and you can hear their music in it. That's job security. So um, that's one of the things we do know that as uh, uh, with all the personal listening devices, there is an increase of hearing issues in, in people and at younger ages. So that's 
uh, something to keep in mind. But uh, is the job market good? Yes. Uh, if you look at uh, Money Magazine US News, as you can see, it's ranked the 22nd best healthcare job and overall the 79th best job out of 100. Um, there's going to be great growth, uh, as I was just saying. 10% uh, growth in, in employment is expected from the next 10 years. So uh, once you graduate from the program, yes, um, you'll be able to find a job. And uh, I don't know of any student, again, I've been here 24 years, I don't know of any student who upon graduation did not get a job. Um, so that's something important to, you to keep in mind also. Um, and if you look at the career, uh, career cast, we're ranked the 14th best job out of 200. And Dr. Zaleski, where what are some of the um, the locations, right? What are some of the places where audiologists might be employed? I mean, I'm sure there's some obvious ones like again hospitals, but are there any other you know common locations where where alumni have been placed? Sure, sure. Um, yes, hospitals. Uh, we're seeing more and more people uh, as we have upgraded. Uh, to a doctoral profession, opening up private practices. Uh, they work in clinics. They work in physician's office, especially with ear, nose, and throat uh, physicians. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people, uh, and, and this is what, what I often say, or let, let me, I don't want to uh, uh, get off the, the, the question. Uh, they can work in for, for manufacturers, mm -hmm. uh, hearing aid manufacturers, uh, equipment manufacturers. I know myself when um, I worked clinically and I had a problem with equipment or hearing it, it was always best to talk to an audiologist because they understand talking to someone who doesn't have the background. They're reading from the notes. We all call the tech service for our computers and you know the people who are reading from the script and those who understand it. Um, so they work in, in, they can work in manufacturers, they can work in schools. There's a huge need for audiologists in the schools. Uh, there's just a shortage uh, for some reason. Um, they can work in, um, um, in, manu in industries for mm -hmm. uh, hearing conservation. Um, they can go on and uh, like we have in our clinic, we have uh, clinical supervisors that are employed by the university to uh, uh, monitor and supervise the students so they learn and grow and, and do things the appropriate way. So there's a lot of different locations where people can, can work. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. All right, so any other questions on this at this point? Uh, nothing in the Q&A. All okay. right, so, so job market is good, so you don't have to worry about that, okay? Um, next thing people wanna know, am I gonna be able to pay my bills? And yes, uh, you can see the salaries here uh, from part-time being 62,000 to the median 87, almost 88 to the, the Pennsylvania full-time being 90,000. Now, remember, uh, if, if you forgot your statistic, median is the middle score. So that is right in the middle. So there's 50% of the people above that and 50% below it. But the question is, they don't say how far, you know, we don't have the range. It didn't give us that. But my thought is it's probably not too much more below that. Uh, people are probably hovering around those ranges. It's probably uh, a greater number and the higher number goes up uh, above that. So that's something. Come up. So, so we will be able to, to pay your bills and uh, uh, live comfortably. Yes, uh, it, it is. And I will tell you, um, the, the research has shown out there that individuals, oops, I pressed the wrong button again. Um, individuals will, uh, who make the most money are those in private practice. People in private practice are easily into, uh, the six figures. Um, and, um, I'm just going to go on and say in the people who come to the audiology program and, uh, take the interoperative monitoring track, um, have that background, uh, they are also well into the six figures. They get compensated very well for what they do. So um, yes, it's a little extra work, but they get compensated very well. All right. Okay, so um, let's get into why everyone's here. Let's talk about the uh, doctorate of audiology here at Bloomsburg. So first question is, why should you come to Bloomsburg? Uh, 
our, our faculty are all PhD prepared. Uh, we have a broad range of experience uh, in different areas. All of us can do the basic testing and, and fitting, uh, but we all have different areas of expertise. Uh, my personal expertise are auditory processing and tinnitus. Uh, we have people who have hearing aids and balance, so uh, uh, there's, there's a, a, a wide range. Um, as I said previously, we have excellent uh, clinical supervisors um, who have a wealth of experience um, and really do a great job in shaping uh, the students to uh, take that theory. And that's where, that's where the practical application comes. So in the classroom, we talk about the theory and we give you labs to do. And then those clinical supervisors take that and apply it in in the, the the clinics which is really nice um audiology has lots of toys so we have lots of toys uh you know with with rotary chairs and um interoperative monitoring equipment and real ear systems and on and on and on um you know audiology is is uh, a really uh, has lots of toys and, and it's an expensive uh uh program to run um one of the most unusual things of our program is, uh, as compared to other programs, is the students in our program are in a clinic setting from day one. Um, I know programs out there where students don't get any clinical experience to the second year or the third year or even their fourth year of their program. Um, from our, uh, the way our program is set up from day one. Um, Again, not the very you we we uh, you are in clinic, but you're learning the equipment the very first day. Uh, you're not seeing patients on day one until you show you have certain competencies. But you're in the clinic. You're you're observing. You're learning the paperwork, and you're seeing how things flow, and and seeing how uh, other students, the second year students, are doing things. So you're in there watching and observing and applying the that theory from day one. Um, another nice thing is uh, our program cost is uh, much lower than others. And I know there's a lot of programs out there uh, that will try to lure students in because I've had students come talk to me and say this, um, you know, I applied to XYZ program and they said they're going to give me a $10,000 scholarship. And, and I, from being around, I know everyone who goes in certain programs, they get a large scholarship. But even with that large scholarship, our costs without anything is still cheaper, less expensive than um, some of these programs where they're offering you a large scholarship to come there. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, and, and so that's very important. Any questions about that? Yeah, and there's nothing in, in the Q&A right now, but as we talk about the, the, the clinic and the labs, um, you know, I know for us at Bloomsburg, this is, this program is one of our banner programs, right? This is one of the things that puts us on the map. We have the bachelor's program, we have the master's program in speech pathology, we have the doctor program in audiology. So from a university perspective, this is a program that we have, you know, put a lot of emphasis on. And, and I think it kind of shows with the, the state-of-the-art clinic and labs, every school kind of has their niche, this is one of our things, right? We might not do anything better than we do this, right? Um, so I think as a prospective student, it's important to know that this is a huge priority for us as an institution. Okay, so let's move on. Also, why else do you wanna to come to Bloomsburg? Um, here's some achievement data that we have, and this is, has to be submitted to uh, our accreditation agency. So this is why we know this, yes, and they require a three-year average. Um, so you can see over the past three years, all the students have completed the program and all of our students are employed. Um, out of that, just about 88, might I say, just about 88% of the students have passed the Praxis. The Praxis is uh, the national exam to get license and or certification. Um, you know, we wish that was higher, but things happen uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, so, so, uh, we, we see that, but, and, and we'd like to get that higher, but still, um, 80, 88% is, is a nice, uh, there's, there's a high probability that if you complete the program, yes, you will be able to complete the, the exam and to get your license as well as certifications. 
Okay, some a little bit more things about the Bloomsburg program. It is a four year program. Um, so that's something you got to keep in mind. Um, and and uh, the first two years, the way it is set up, it is it emphasizes the academics, the, the theory in the classroom, as well as teaching you those foundational skills uh, to prepare you. Um, it's like anything else. Every profession has any clinically applied profession has some foundational skills. And before the students go out, they spend uh, a lot of time in our on-campus clinic learning those foundational skills. So when they go off, the clinical supervisors aren't they don't have to spend the time teaching us, teaching them those basic skills. Yes, increasing in speed and getting uh, greater experience with different types of patients. Yes, uh, but the foundational skills, uh, our students are, are solid on that. So that, that's the first two years. The, the second two years focuses on, again, still some academics, but expanding your clinical knowledge, uh, your, your skills and abilities. Uh, so you have the foundation, but in, in seeing different types of patients, different settings, different issues, different pro disease processes, different types of hearing losses, learning how other people do things, that's important. Uh, the third year is really, um, it's a hybrid. You're taking classes, two days a week, and then three days a week, you're off campus uh, getting part-time experience those three days at a facility within two hours of Bloomsburg. Um, and the reason why we have to go two hours out, Bloomsburg is a rural location. It's not like a metropolitan area where you walk down the street and there are you know, seven ENTs, there's five private practices, there's you know, seven clinics, and yes, you, we could do that. We wish we had that luxury, but unfortunately, uh, we don't have that luxury. So uh, to make sure the students get a, a variety of experiences, they have to travel about two hours. Uh, not everybody, we do have some that are close. Um, you know, in, in the town of Bloomsburg, there is one private practice. Uh, there is an ENT office in, in Bloomsburg. But then when you start going out, it gets a little bit uh, uh, further away. Like then there's Geisinger. Uh, it's a major hospital that's about uh, 40, about 30 minutes down the road uh, from there. Um, fourth year is a full-time off-campus clinical experience and and students can actually go any place we've had students california tech we have a student now down in texas um you know michigan new hampshire florida you know again most of the time people stay in probably the tri-state area because that's where we draw most of our students from pennsylvania new york uh maryland new jersey kind of in those areas there but people for one reason or another, want to go out in, in different areas. Um, and, and I'm sorry, Tom, we had a, a really good question from Wahida. Um, she wanted to know, uh, for the fourth year, do we have to find our externships or are we placed? All right, good question. Third year, our supervisors will place you. Fourth year, uh, because we're not sure exactly where type, what type of experiences you want. Uh, we we ask the students to locate the, the, their fourth years. However, uh, our supervisors and faculty are there to help if you can't find it. Again, I've been here uh, 24 years. Uh, the AUD program started like 2004, so about 20 years. Uh, I've never known a student not to find a fourth year placement. Uh, so everyone gets a fourth year placement. Uh, I will tell you there are some student or there are some facilities, um, both third year and fourth year have contacted us and said, uh, they will take only Bloomsburg students because uh, they've taken students from other uh, facilities and they felt those students were not as prepared. Um, as our students. So um, that's the best I can tell you. But, um, you know, I know some students now that are um, looking for fourth year, the current third year students are looking for fourth years. And there's, there's students looking in Utah, in North Carolina, Florida, Michigan, um, Maryland. So 
again, they're, they're kind of all over the place uh, and it depends on the type of experience you want. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that, that sounds like that 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 was answered to me. And, and Bahida, if you're looking for uh, more details, please let us know. Thank you. And, and the other thing about the Bloomsburg program, as I said, so if we have a specialty track in the inter interoperative neurophysical physiological monitoring um, that the audiology students can get into. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. And we also have a research track if someone's interested in doing uh, uh, a dissertation, they can can do a dissertation and get that on. Uh, but I do know there's also students who want to do research, but don't want to uh, uh, have the stress and anxiety of, of writing a dissertation. And they do uh, research and they present it at conferences or they write them up for publications. So uh, we have that also. So, so that's some more information about the Bloomsburg program. So let's let's move on, and and I'm sure you are interested in the type of courses. Here's our first year, and again, I'm not going to read these so you guys can see them, but I'm going to tell you how it works. Right, um, all of our students take a, carry 12 credits per semester. Right, the they carry they carry three academic courses, so you can see your first fall diagnostic ones, the hearing aids theory and technology and the introduction to interoperative monitoring. The fourth course in every semester during the first three years, and you'll see that, is the, the clinical experience. So every semester, you are in clinic uh, building upon the skills and abilities and the knowledge, taking the knowledge that you have, getting in a class, applying it hands on. Right. So so that's how it how it works. Right. So you can see there it is. And our program runs year round. Um, so it goes fall, spring, summer, fall, spring, summer, second year, fall, spring, summer, third year, fall, spring is the fourth year. And the fourth year is a little different. And, and when we get there, uh, we'll talk about it. OK. Um, second year. Again, you can see the courses. And in the way we develop this course, is the, the, the course sequence is to give you the foundational information courses first. So if we go back here, it, diagnostic one is the bread and butter. It's really about how to do basic pure tone testing. Uh, and then the theory of hearing aids, how do hearing aids really work? And then there's the, interop the introduction interoperative modeling to determine do students want to go in to that track, right? And then get some more basic underlying theory of hearing science and then diagnostic too, looking at middle ear testing. And so that is how our program is set up. And when we get into the second year, third year, there are courses that are building upon those courses. Um, you got to keep in mind, we aren't accredited uh, program. So our program meets all of the standards, educational standards by the academic accreditation agency. So um, uh, you know that. So the courses that we're off are just not, you know, here or there, they are the specific courses to meet all the knowledge and skills that you would need. So again, there's the second year. Again, I'm not going to go into those, but you can see now a hearing science two course, a balance two course. Uh, then there's the clinical you know, considerations of the hearing aids. So building upon what we have, getting more advanced, uh, building off of that information. And again, you can see um, there is uh, the, the clinic course at the end. Then we get to the third year, again, fall, spring, summer, taking three courses. Uh, these are still important courses, um, but we designed them so it wouldn't be as rigorous, where these courses will not require a whole bunch of labs, uh, because we know students are off campus three days a week, and it takes time. So, so yes, you're still getting theory to apply things, so it's growing and expanding knowledge. But now, again, rather than being on campus, you're off campus getting part-time experience. Uh, Dr. Zaleski, um, Kristen had a great question. She wants to know, uh, so to confirm, a dissertation is not a part of the curriculum. No, it is not a requirement. 
It is not a requirement. If you, if a student chooses to do a dissertation, they can. Um, and it is a uh, graduate school policy, they would have to take an additional six credits. And that is the requirement of the graduate school in order to, to complete all those things. So no, the dissertation is not a requirement, but there are some students who think, well, you know, I wanna be an expert in, in do some research and be an expert in a specific area. And that allows them to do that or they may think, hmm, maybe someday, maybe I wanna go get a PhD and, and that will get them in. I, I will tell you, um, I did, when I did my back in the dark ages before uh, audiology had to uh, have a doctorate, it was a master's level field. So my, the program I went through had a, had a master's thesis. So I did a thesis and then when I applied for my PhD, um, um, talking to my advisor, uh, that's what really got me in the door. Uh, he was impressed with the research that I did as a master's student. And so that's what really opened the door. So if someone has some interest, that's why we have that track. If someone's thinking, geez, maybe I'd like to do research or maybe go on for a, a PhD, they have that option. And then fourth year, is the full-time off-campus experience. So uh, you just carry that clinic, you're off fall and spring, uh, working full-time. Uh, most, I will tell you, most students receive some type of compensation. Um, those who don't um, sometimes choose that. And in my experience has been that um, the facilities that don't offer the any type of compensation offer often often offer the best experience um, and that's why they they don't because um, they're big name facilities and people are knocking down their door anyway to come there so so that's kind of where, where that works any questions on that's that's kind of summarizes the audiology program any questions before we move on uh no questions right now i know i have a question though so um this is, you know, students are still taking 12 credits. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the course delivery? Like what is the, what's the difference in being in the audiology program versus being in an undergraduate program? Is, are the classes longer? They should like, talk a little bit about some of the, like the individual days if possible. Um, good question. Um, no, the, the, the courses are not any longer because, you know, academia sets it up where you got to have an X number of classes. But what happens is it's, it's I always like to take to make it easier. It's like when you went from high school to college, um, it's more intense. Um, it is, uh, the expectations are higher. Um, and, and that's just how it is. So if, you know, if you look at the courses, they are getting very specific. Um, someone said to this to me years ago, um, the, the more education you get, the narrow your focus gets, you know, so, so undergraduate, yes, you have all this knowledge, which is great, but as you go further and further, you get narrower and narrower and narrower to where you're looking at a very specific thing. So, um, but from a, from an audiology perspective, because you have to have the doctorate, it's still relatively uh, uh, broad, but it is the, the, the content is very specific to the auditory system. Right. And if you go on to a PhD, you can get very specific in a specific area uh, where your expertise is. Um, also, what tends to happen is uh, students, we tend to have clinic in the morning or during the day. So students are in clinic during the day. Um, and again, depending on the number of students in each cohort, usually it's one half day a week. Uh, so yeah, one half day a week. So we have morning clinic and afternoon clinic. So there's a different students on a group of students on Monday morning and Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, Tuesday to, and you get a variety of experience. Uh, you do have uh, the option of when different things pop up in, in participating in uh, some advanced testing. So yes, if you're a first year and you're interested in uh, balance, and a balanced patient comes in, you can observe and participate in that. Um, tinnitus, you're interested in tinnitus, you can observe and participate in that and see what's, what's happening, get some background. So, so there's always that option. So, so it's clinic work in the morning, 
um, and then classwork in the evening. Great, thanks, Dr. L Dr. Zalewski. Oh, and actually, we do have a couple more questions here. Um, are externships in the third year offered as compensation, or is there a possibility to work while attending the program? It's a good question. Good question. Um, third year, um, most often there is no compensation. There are, I, I do know there are some facilities which will offer gas cards to students and um, um, they that time some facilities that said, can we um, help out and pay for tuition in some way? And, and again, because you're still technically a student, you know, you really can't can't get paid for it. That fourth year, you're kind of a tweener. Um, it, you can think of it kind of like uh, a medical student out on residency. You know, they get a little compensation. So that's kind of how that fourth year is. You're on your residency uh, aspect. That's why we say externship slash residency. Um, some, you know, our students do work, um, but you got to keep in mind, um, you know, you're here primarily for an education and things pop up. You know, we understand students do have to work to pay for bills and housing. Um, and, and Tom will be talking a little bit later about some financial aid and those types of things. But um, um, my experience has been those students who are around um, get involved in a lot. Um, I know myself, uh, when things pop up, I'll walk down the hall and say, you ready? You available? What are you doing now? And nothing. I said, come on with me. You know, or I'll get an email about something going on. So I'll shoot it out to the to all the students, first and second year students. I need X amount of students to do this. First four that see me can go. And if you're there, you get the opportunity. If you're off someplace else, that's where you don't have the opportunities. And that's where um, it really pays off. Um, if you're around and, and it's like anything else, you know, the, the, the more you take advantage of what you have in the long run, you're going to be better. So uh, understanding, yes, I know students do have to work, but you need to, to walk a fine line between, all right, I need to be available because there are things where we have special events. We have, we bring manufacturers in and guest lectures in and, and it's not allowable to say, sorry, I have to work. You know, if we bring somebody in, you have to be there to to do that because we're bringing that in for a purpose. Right. And, and I, you know, the, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is that, I mean, this is a field where your earning potential is going to be pretty high. So the, the, the gratification is there. It's just it's a little delayed. Right. So you saw right. some of the salaries that are there. Um, so, again, your earning potential is going to be pretty high when you, when you graduate. You're going to be in pretty high demand. So it's again, it's one of those things where it's a worthwhile investment in your future career. Um, there was a, a follow up question to that then in the fourth year. Is it the full cost of tuition or do we pay fees only? I have heard of programs with both options. OK, um, fourth year is yes, there is tuition, but it's only six credits each semester. So it's six in the fall, six in the spring. All right. Um, and so, yes, you do got to pay the, the tuition also. And then Christian has a great question. Um, how would the program handle a student who's in the military part time and say would have to deploy in their third or fourth year of school? Would the student be able to continue in a different cohort when they returned home? That's a great question. That is a good question. Actually, we are doing that now. We have a student who was in the reserves and um, came to us. When was it? Uh, spring of 20? I think spring of 20. Came and said, I just got notice I'm going to be deployed. And so, yes, so the student was given a leave of absence. And uh, the student wasn't sure they could leave anywhere from like November to like March. And the student started, uh, I think, like the first week or two in this. January of of 22 and she was they had to deploy so she left off there when she comes back she's going to pick up where she left off with that other cohort and move through from that aspect so good question but yes there are allowances for uh, for those things because that's very important and um the, the person who is there you know thank you for your service um it's yes. very important we we, we do 
appreciate that. And we do take that into consideration and we understand your dedication, what needs to go in that. So yes, there is allowances for those types of things. Um, as I told the other students, um, because you are new at this, you lose your skills and abilities. So if there's ways, there are some online programs where you can kind of keep up your skills and abilities so you don't lose, um, that's important also. But understand you may not be able to, but it, it's if you can, that would be a benefit to you. Any other questions? Uh, that looks like it's it for right now. Again, these are great questions. Please keep keep them coming. Um, actually, we do have another one here from Santino here. Um, are GAs offered during the first or uh, the fourth year of externships slash residency? Okay. Um, GAs are offered the first and second year. Third and fourth year, they are not uh, because fourth year, because most of the students re some, receive some type of compensation. Third year, it just gets tough. You know, you're taking three classes on Monday and Tuesday, and then you're off working the hours, you know, at least eight hours a day. Some facilities, you know, some students work more than that because on certain days they'll do 10 hour or 12 hour. They'll make Thursdays are my, are their late dates. And so they're there eight to eight. Um, so it just gets tough for them uh, to do that. So there is no inter or GAs offered during the third and fourth year. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, not for now. No. Nope. Okay. So that's that's the audiology program, um, kind of in in a nice overview. Um, so we're going to jump into the interoperative neurophysiological monitoring. Uh, the this is one of the unusual. We are one of the few programs. There are very very few programs in the country that offer this alongside their audiology program. Um, I will tell you, because uh, I was here and I helped develop part of this, um, uh, the, the uh, people who hire our graduates love our students because um, a lot of times they pull students from biology or, neurophys or neurophysiology programs. And yes, they have the knowledge, but this is a clinically applied field. And so it allows uh, every, everybody I have ever spoken to say the reason why they loved our students is they have that clinical skills. They're able to interpret and make good decisions to help um, keep uh, the, the, the patient safe. And that's what this is all about. Um, preventing injuries uh, during surgeries. Um, so, so that's that's really the, the purpose of this. Um, so if we go on to here, you can see you're doing real-time monitoring. So during surgical procedures, brain surgeries, spine surgeries, facial surgeries to prevent injuries. Um, that's just what it is. Um, so, so when the surgeon's in there doing something and it requires great communication skills. So um, someone is having brain surgery and the surgeon retracts something and you're doing your monitoring and you see a change in response. That's where you need to say, whoops, don't know what happened, but we had a change. And so now it's the surgeon's uh, decision. All right, what's going on? Or are they going to retract and approach it from a different angle? Or are they going to say, this is the only way I can get and keep in mind that, okay, I have to be very careful and, and really uh, um, can't take too long because the longer those responses are down, the higher probability of having um, um, post-surgery negative effects. And that's what this is all about, to prevent those negative effects. Right. And again, it's it's a wide range, as you see, spine surgery, ENT, uh, neurosurgeries, cardiovascular, you know, so many, so many different areas. Uh, there is a need. And, and a lot of people say, well, why audiology? Because this is actually part of our scope of practice. Right? A lot of people don't realize doing these type of measurements are part of our scope of practice. So that's when it, it falls to us. And we do these things clinically also. Auditory brainstem response, a lot of people do clinically. Visually evoked response, some people do. Uh, long latency response, people do that. They're, they're not during surgery, they're uh, exogenous versus endogenous, um, but, but they are, uh, we, we do those clinically. Um, here is how 
the course works. It's again, the three, three semesters. And what happens is if you look, there is the, the first course of it is the interoperative monitoring, right? So all of our students take it to give them some background. And so what happens is uh, students who decide to uh, go the interoperative monitoring track, um, they carry 15 credits per semester as compared to 12 and they carry one extra credit. So in the fall, you know, so in the spring, well, fall, they'll just take 12 credits. Spring, besides the courses that are or in the audiology, they'll take the functional neuroanatomy. Then in the spring, they'll take the clinical neurophysiology. Next fall, the IOM anesthesia and each semester will take one of these courses. So for 15 credits, and then um, rather than doing um, in their externships or off-campus residencies, um, they can be placed um, um, at a, at a uh, um, company that does interoperative monitoring to learn and develop your skills and abilities. So that's how it works. That's kind of the interoperative monitoring program in summary. Any questions on that? And Dr. Zlowski, um, generally, how many students do this additional certificate? It varies. Um, you know, sometimes there are no students, you know, mm -hmm. who have interest in it. Um, sometimes we have six, seven, eight, nine, ten students. You know, you, it depends on on the interest of the students and what they like. I've had students come through our undergraduate program who have met with me. Oh, I, I want to do this. I want to do this. This is, and they get the intro course and they're like, this is not what I thought it was going to be. You know, so so that's. Uh, um, something. I've had students who have gone the opposite way. They've got the introduction to an IOM course and they fall in love with it and they take it. So, so, so that is something. Um, what you got to keep in mind, this is an additional skill. Um, what yeah. my experience has been that people who tend to go in the interoperative monitoring program and, and go, go the audiology program are not typically doing um, traditional audiology. These are people who are working in hospitals or for companies. They are primarily doing interoperative monitoring um, in surgeries all day. There are some audiologists who are employed by uh, uh, neurologists. Um, and, and so they're there to help them and do their monitoring. But when they're not doing their monitoring uh, in surgeries, they are um, in clinic uh, doing auditory brainstem responses, uh, long latency evoked responses, visually evoked responses, uh, vestibular testing. Uh, they're not doing basic testing. Now, the benefit of having the audiology degree is there are some states which set you at a higher level. So um, mm -hmm. I believe it's, it's either New Jersey or New York. Um, if you have your, your audiology license, and I believe one of the certifications, um, you can do remote monitoring. So you can sit home in your bunny slippers and your coffee <laughs> and with your computer in front of you and monitor X amount of techs out there, you know, in your operative monitoring technicians. And so you're monitoring their screens. And so you have to have communication with them. So now you communicate with the technician in the OR who then communicates with the OR staff to tell them. And, and those pay, people make really good money uh, sitting at home in their bunny slippers. So uh, that's, that's you know, a great thing. So that's the benefit of getting the IOM or the audiology uh, with the IOM. Um, and, and once you have that knowledge and skill, you know, people can't take it away from you. I, I always said, you know, if if this was available when I was going through, whether or not I wanted to do it, I probably would have done it because it's an extra skill set that you have and you never know where it's going to en end up. Um, and yeah, it sounds like it's a pretty powerful combination, the combo of the doctor of, of audio and, and the cert. Um, and Kristen has a follow up question. Um, if you choose to do the I1M program and do that externship, is there enough clinical audio experience? Some yes, I mean it. Well, 
it depends on what you want to do. We've had students who who want to do it, right? And and some students may say, "All right, I want to do a um, um, interoperative monitoring in the fall, and then or in the spring for one or two semesters, but then I just want to go audiology." So they want to have a little bit of experience. So so we can be flexible with, with some of those things uh, for people. But again, there are students who who I know who in the past who have taken all the courses and said, OK, I have the knowledge, but I want to do I don't want to do the clinic aspect. I want audiology. I just wanted the knowledge. And that's fine also. So so um, yes, we have students I, I'm thinking of you know, a handful of students who went through the whole program and kind of rotated and bopped back and forth who are working full time as audiology. Okay, great, thanks. Any other questions on the IOM program? Uh, nothing right now. All right, so we'll move it over and I'll turn it over to you, Tom. Right. So you've heard a lot about, um, you know, this outstanding program. Um, so now the next question is, all right, uh, what do I need to do to get in? Um, and you can see up on the screen the list of required materials that you need to send and some of the admission expectations. Probably the most important thing, and I don't think this comes as much of a surprise, is that the application is facilitated through SIDCAS. So it's not like you would go to the Bloomsburg website and submit the app. Um, and you can see there's a one page typed letter. Um, that really just helps us understand your professional background and why you want to get into the program. You know, kind of the genesis of, of kind of how you found your way to the Bloomsburg audiology degree. Um, the three letters of rec um, are going to be pretty important, um, specifically the ones that can, you know, uh, you know, attest to your academic ability and one specifically that can speak to your ability in relevant coursework or clinical backgrounds that will be relevant in this field. Um, so I think, you know, having a, a coach or something that would certainly still be helpful, um, but probably not quite as impactful as maybe a faculty member from one of your classes as an undergraduate. Um, obviously, a, a current resume. And as you'll see, the GRE scores are not required this year for fall of 2023. So that's not going to be a requirement in order to be considered for admission or to be con uh, considered for uh, graduate assistantships. Um, there are going to be some prerequisite courses um, that we think Tom, you're going to need. Can I just? Can I oh, just, yeah, yeah, please do. Okay. Go ahead. Just, just a couple of things, folks. What you have to remember is um, um, with your, your one page letter, as well as your letters of recommendation. All right, we are using those, and every program is, is using that information to determine what are the odds of you completing the program successfully. And that's, that's the important aspect. So, so you need to tell us why you're going to complete that program successfully. You know, uh, I often tell students when it gets, uh, when they ask me, well, what do you put down the, the letter uh, for the, letter, the personal statements? And if you ask 10 people, you get 10 different answers. There is no right, there are different wrong. But from my perspective, I've read um, personal letters that start off like sound. What is sound? Without sound, the world is alone. Great, great essay. But what is that telling me about your abilities to complete the program? So, so what I often tell students is, you know, if I called up the phone and said, hey, you know, we have two position. We have one position left it's between you and somebody else. Tell me why you are the best candidate for this program. Right. And if you view it from that perspective, you're probably going to hit the points which which are important. Same thing with the letters of recommendation, as, as Tom kind of in indicated. Um, you know, who's better to attest to your um, academic skills and ability? Um, you know, a, a neighbor, a friend, a relative or a faculty member that's had you in class. So, so and, and that's what we're looking for, you know, who, you know, trying to weed through all this information to find out who are the best students and who are most likely to be successful. Yeah, a lot of these, they're almost like they're narratives that should really kind of support your resume in your, in your academic record, right? They, they should, you know, be uh, um, augmenting those two, those two documents, right? Um, so, 
the prompt, it sounds like Dr. Zaleski just kind of provided, which I think is always really helpful um, because there were so many, you know, directions you could go in with some of these, some of these other, you know, documentation that you have to submit for admission. But um, I think the ones that, that we're going to, you know, pay the most attention to are the ones that are a little more straightforward. Um, your writing ability is very important, um, but also, again, the content of what's included in these is going to be equally as important as well. Um, and then there's a, the minimum undergrad GPA of a 3.0, and you can see that there's a minimum of three credits in each of the subjects listed on the screen, which I'm, you know, I'm not going to just re read those off. Um, and then we need official college transcripts from any colleges that you've attended, right? So if you start off at one school, transfer to another, graduate from that second school, we would still need both transcripts. Um, and then we would need TOEFL scores for any international students. And we did have a, a good question from Santino previously. And actually, this is probably a question for you, Dr. Zaleski. Um, as a prospective student with continuing education certificates in audiology, how do you share them to boost your application since SIDCAS does not include that opportunity? Um, and does that improve your admission and GA opportunities? Um, I mean, it, it can help some. Um, you know, and, and what you got to keep in mind with continuing education, um, they're, they're completed in a lot of different ways. Uh, a lot of times they're not graded. It's just, yeah, I completed it and, and, you know, certificate of completion. So, um, it really depends on it. So it can help some and, and give you a background, um, and, and I believe through SIDCAS, there is ways to add, to upload. Again, I'm not, I'm not completely savvy on, on the SIDCAS from your side, but I believe there is ways to upload uh, additional materials if, if need be through SIDCAS. And if you'd want to upload those, you're, you're more than welcome to, uh, to do that. Um, and, and so, yes, we can take those into consideration to decide um, if whatever is there um, adds to your uh, materials to, to determine if you'll be successful or not. Yep. Thank you, Santino. And uh, a really good uh, follow-up question from Wahida. Uh, for recommendation letters, if we were COVID-19 students where classes were online, no real connections could be made with faculty, how should we go about that? Would managers or doctors we worked with be okay? Um, I mean, again, again, you can, but but when, when we talk about that, and 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 you know, we've run into those situations also, uh, and I think everybody is. Um, you didn't have the time to see them face to face and, and those types of things. Uh, but I know myself because we were online. There were still those same good students coming and asking questions. You know, staying after. So so I'm sure. Um, uh, you know, being that you're here, you're probably quality students. And, and even though you didn't see them face to face, I'm sure uh, those faculty would recognize you and say, yeah, uh, you know, I'll, I'll write you a letter or be familiar with you. It won't be the same as face to face contact, but I'm sure they'll have it. And, and again, if you want to submit somebody else to do that, again, that is your decision. I always tell people when you submit your application, you have to be comfortable in what you're submitting. You know, you have to look at it as this is the best I've done. Here it is. And where the chips fall, the chip falls. Um, mm -hmm. And if you view it that way, I did my very best and see what happens. Um, um, and it usually turns out for the, for the better. And uh, I just want to note that uh, Sierra um, had seconded um, what he does uh, recommendation that uh, she kind of gone through the similar situation. Now, um, Wahida had mentioned what happened if she were able to get the letters of rec from doctors or, or from other medical professionals. Is that how would you weigh that versus some of, you know, if it, it were a faculty? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the relationships that they had with you. So, uh, you know, my, my family doctor or, you know, I've, I've had surgery and my surgeon writing it, or is it someone who you've worked with and, and has, you know, can write about your skills and abilities in being able to successfully complete the program. Um, so, so it depends on, on the perspective in which it is written in. Okay, great, thank you. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I don't see any other questions about admissibility. Um, mm -hmm. The one thing I did want to mention is that um, there is an application due date, which uh, is February 1st. So it's important to get all your application materials in sooner rather than later. Um, also for you on a personal level, just allows you to be able to make decisions sooner as well, right? So that, yeah. you know, hopefully you're not going to be held up as, as much. So um, the earlier you apply, the better. 
Um, Santino has a follow-up uh, where CCAS does not offer further attachment aside from resume and a personal essay. Is okay. it possible to share? Um, yeah, and Santino, um, you can certainly um, email that to me. Let me put my contact information in the chat and I can work with our team to get that uploaded. And same goes for anybody else. You can feel free to contact me with some additional you know, supplemental materials. I'd be happy to get those attached. Let's see. Um, not sure if I missed this information, but uh, is there an interview process? No, um, you do not have an interview process. Yes, Sorry, these are. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. No, 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 no. It, by all means, I, honestly, I mean, yeah, you're 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 probably the guy they want to hear from. So, um, no, th these are all outstanding questions, though. Great questions. So, I don't see anything else in the Q and A right now. So we can um, move move on to the next slide. And you know, we've talked a lot about the financial investment. Of, of this degree and, and really, again, you're looking at this from the perspective of A, it's investment and it's investment that will track you into a career that you're clearly very passionate about. Um, now, in addition to, um, you know, conventional financial aid packages, which basically every other, you know, regionally accredited university is going to be able to provide. Um, Bloomsburg, we offer a wealth of graduate assistantships. Um, there are GAs in the communication sciences and disorders department, but you are not limited to graduate assistantships in that department. We have GAs in a number of different departments on campus, um, from administrative to academic. Um, we do have a interview, um, an interview day every spring. That's not the only day that we interview people. Um, and normally it's kind of like a, um, like a meet and greet type situation where you can interview with multiple people on the same day. Um, but again, we, we will post a lot of our graduate assistantships um, as we get deeper into the spring semester. Um, our GAs, most of them will cover, um, it, there's a 20 hour working requirement and it would cover six out of the 12 or nine out of the 12 credits that you would be taking as a student enrolled in the audiology program. And then you would also get a stipend. Um, and again, those are graduate assistantships. The other thing I wanted to mention too is just uh, Bloomsburg in general. Um, the cost of higher education in Pennsylvania is very affordable. Um, Bloomsburg has frozen tuition um, every year for the last four years. Um, so basically you're starting from a very competitive place to begin with. So as you were looking at, you know, going in and getting your doctor in audiology, you're gonna be in school for a little bit. So one of the things you wanna pay attention to is how much debt you are accruing. Um, and even though, you know, I said earlier, your, your earning potential will be higher than nearly any other career fields out there starting off, all that, you know, the, the, the debt is still real. So um, I am highly confident though, that you'd be hard pressed to find a better value in your education than what you would find at, you know, in the Bloomsburg audiology program. So that should be, as you're weighing some of your options and you're looking at other schools, that is something that you would want to start to pay some, some closer attention to. Um, but again, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Zalesky. No, what, 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 what you got to remember uh, is that just because you have higher debt, so it's not like you apply for a job and the job is you know, where it is and here's the, the salary. And it's not like, how much debt do you have? Oh, you have $100,000 debts? Oh, the salary starts there. You have $300,000? Oh, we're going to pay. No, if, if you have no debt, if you have $300,000 worth of debt, the starting salary is the starting salary. And that's what you got to keep in mind when you're, when you're thinking of these things also. Right. And, and, you know, the other misnomer that we deal with a lot just in higher ed in general is normally the in any other arena, the more you pay for something, generally, the higher the quality. Right. Cars, jeans, whatever it is. Normally, if you pay more, you're going to get a better product. Education is not like that. It's not quite that simple. Um, so even though you might not pay as much as what you might pay at another institution, that doesn't mean you get a better education from, from some of those other schools. And a lot of that goes into the state that the school is located in and how we're funded. So, for instance, uh, at Bloomsburg, uh, we get a lot of funding from the state of Pennsylvania, right? And because of that, we can afford to charge you less than what your education actually costs. Um, so, again, when you talk about value, it'd be very difficult to beat the value of what you would find in the, the doctorate program in audiology at Bloomsburg. And let me see here. Um, so, Santino had a couple questions about admission. Is a 3.2 GPA perfect for admission? So, um, again, the minimum GPA um, expectation is a 3.0. 
Obviously, the higher the GPA, though, the more likely you are um, to be able to, to gain admission. Dr. Zaleski, did you have anything you wanted to add Correct. there? You know, it's, it's I get questions like this all the time from students all different GPA. Um, and it really depends on the strength of the cohorts. Um, there are times, you know, I know we've had some core cohorts, if they would apply to your layer, none of them would have got in because it was a stronger cohort. So you don't know what it's going to be. Every cohort varies. Um, um, and again, as I always say, um, it's, it's, a lot of students come to, come to me and say it all the time. It also, it's not just the number. This is why we ask to submit your, your transcript so we can look at that. It's how you got to that number. You know, so, so I often say is you have two students who are, you know, three, four students. And, and student one has a three, four, has met all their withdrawals, have taken uh, only introductory level courses. Student B with the three four, no withdrawals, no repeat. Has it taken? Has taken advanced courses in the sciences and math? And what? Well, well, who's the better student? You know, right. so the number's the same, correct? But it's how you get to that number, and so that's what we look at. What are the quality of courses that you take to to get there? And uh, Santino had a follow-up question. Um, do you have any supportive programs for international students seeking GAs? So we do have a global studies office on campus um, that, that provides support um, just, you know, in general, in, in a number of different ways. Um, but generally, the, the graduate assistantship seeking process would not really be any different for an international student versus a domestic student. But Santino, that's, that's a great question. Um, Kristen wants to know um, how many students, or I guess how large are your co cohorts? Okay. All right. Um, our program is built for a maximum of 15 students, um, and we've had 15 students. Um, we tend and we tend to do best between like seven to 10 students, um, simply because when we start getting up near that 15, that's a lot of students in clinic to give them the clinic time. And when we're at about seven to 10 students. Air, you know, we have enough where like one or two students morning and afternoon, and it does does really well. Um, but for the most part, it varies from year to year. Uh, our goal is to get to 15 students. Uh, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, I would say on average, we tend to average between like seven to 10 students a year. Okay. And uh, we had another follow up question here. Um, how many people generally, how many people apply um, for each given year and how many are, are accepted? And I'm assuming part of the answer is going to be each year is going to be different. Correct. Correct. Uh, but, you know, typically uh, you do have ups and downs. Uh, we're generally around 80s or 90s. You know, we've had as low as 60 students apply, and we've had as many as 130, 140 apply. So, you know, it, it varies. Um, and and again, how many of those get accepted? You know, we work to get 15. What what everyone has to remember is just as all of you are looking at different schools, and that's why you're here. Hopefully, we we've said why we want you at Bloomsburg and you're saying, yep, that's where I want to be and when your dream school. But, you know, so, but that may not be everybody. It might be, yes, I'd like to go to Bloomsburg, but right. my dream school is this other school. So you apply to four or five other schools. Most students apply to about five schools. And, and so what happens is, you know, we may accept someone, someone will accept our offer. And so they're on a wait list at their dream school. And, and what happens is, um, um, their dream school calls up and says, hey, do you want to come? They say, yeah. So that opens a spot here. We go to our wait list and say, hey, do you want to come? So, so what I often tell students is no news is good news. Uh, that doesn't mean you weren't accepted, but it doesn't mean you were accepted. And uh, there's been times where, uh, you know, we're getting, you know, close to the first week of the semester, people call up and say, I'm not coming for one reason or another. And we go to our wait list and say, hey, do you want to come? So it, it, you never know what's going to happen. And I would imagine that's a, pro that's, that's a pretty standard practice for any yeah. program like this, because, you know, it's not like it's an online, you know, master's program in, you know, 
in, in communications or anything like that. And that's no disrespect to communications, but in this program, it's taught in person. There's clinical requirements. It's a four year commitment. Like you can't bring in more than what you can feasibly place in clinicals and that get, gets into accreditation. So it is, you have to walk a very fine line here where you kind of have to be pretty, pretty judicious. And again, as a prospective student, you're probably thinking the same thing is I only get this decision once I want to pick the right school and I want to make sure I get you know, I get to go someplace where I'm happy. So we, what we're looking for is that mutually um, interested relationship here. So I hope that answered your question. And I don't see there's anything else in, in the Q&A about admissions and financial aid. So okay. Dr. Zaleski, I think we can probably move on. Oops, one too many it was, there it is. We're on questions anyway. Any other questions? Perfect. And again, these have been outstanding questions to, to begin yeah. with. I, you all clearly have done your due diligence. And again, that's that's good. I mean, this is this is a big decision. Other than deciding where you were going to go to college, um, you know, for your undergrad degree, this is probably the next most important um, decision that you're going to make, right? Because you're going to spend another four years here too. So you want to make sure you've, like I said, done your due diligence and you know you've had an opportunity to kind of preview your experience at Bloomsburg. Um, are there any options for graduate housing on campus? Yes, there are. There most certainly are. Um, we have on-campus housing. Um, and as a grad student, you know, it's not like you're gonna be living in residence halls, you'd be living, if you wanted to live on campus in apartment complexes. Um, and if you're not familiar with the community of Bloomsburg, um, it is, and you're probably expecting me to say this, it is beautiful, um, but the, the university was the first organization, the first business built in the area and the town is built around it. So there is off-campus student housing as well, um, the form of a lot of like larger apartment complexes, where if you wanted to live off-campus, um, you would still be living in a student community, still have that really close connection to campus because you'd be located in very close proximity as well. Um, but again, this is not an online MBA, right? Like you're going to spend time here. And so that's one of the factors that you probably want to take into account is, do I like the area? Um, so I put the, the virtual tour in the chat. It's not often, um, you know, grad students are going to be looking at that, but I think for the program that you're going for, you're going to spend a lot of time here. You want to make sure you like the area. I normally describe the, the town of Bloomsburg as like a Norman Rockwell painting of a college town. I mean, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's very nice. Um, what, what, what I can tell you is I've known a lot of students who came to Bloomsburg from New York, New Jersey, Maryland, um, other places and end up living in the vicinity because they just fall in love with the area. Um, the other thing, uh, what happens is if you get accepted and you decide to come here, um, we develop a packet that will be sent out to you in, in May or June that has all this information of, of housing and everything you need to know uh, from, from that perspective. So uh, you don't have to worry about those things. So all that is we have it together um, or we get it together and we send that to you so you can uh, look at your options. Um, and we have some follow-up questions here about the the, um, the program here. Um, well, he wants to know how long are the semesters and what breaks are built into the year? Okay, uh, the, the semesters are 15 weeks long. Um, the longest break is between the fall and, and winter and spring semester. Um, that's about a six week break. Um, in between the spring and the summer, um, it's a one week break. And in between the summer and the fall is a one week break. My apologies, um, is a one week break. So there used to be two weeks in between and they've somehow whittled those away to uh, one week in between the fall <laughs> and spring and I'm sorry, spring and summer and summer and fall. But the long one is the winter. It's a six week break. No rest for the weary. Um, Santino wants to know, do you consider diversity, inclusion, and acceptance, and how many students from Africa normally apply? Honestly, I do not track that number, so I can't truly answer you how many students apply. Um, have we had international students? Yes. How many of them through the years have been specifically from Africa? I, I would really have to think because, you know, in, in, in my mind, um, I view it as uh, I don't care where you're from. If you're the best students, I want you in the program. <laughs> Bottom line, if if all 15 ended up being from Africa and they were the best students, 
I'd be happy with that. So, so, uh, but to be honest with you, I, I really can't track that number and, and think about, I know definitely we've had people from, from Asia. Uh, we've had them from, from South America uh, off the top of my head. Uh, but, but I'm not sure if we really had uh, anyone specifically from Africa, but I, I don't want to commit to that because I don't, I don't really know. Uh, Christian has had a question um, about COVID-19. Um, how has COVID-19 affected clinical and research opportunities and are they lasting during these post-COVID times? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Good, good question. Um, yes, it did. <laughs> um, um, our clinics were limited. The amount of experience our students got was limited and that's worldwide. Um, it, it happened to everybody and, and um, our accreditation air, uh, agencies have taken that into consideration and has made that. Um, but just as the world is loosening up, um, so are we. Um, just two weeks ago, a week, two weeks ago, um, we no longer have to wear masks in the clinic. Um, so, so things are loosening up. And yes, did it impact research? Yes, because for a period of time, as a matter of fact, I was in the middle of a research project and they said, stop. So we had to end our, our project at the time. Um, so, um, but now everything is open, everything is back. So um, unless there's another flare up, which if I had a crystal ball, I, I'd be a wealthy man, um, but we don't know. And, and so that's, you know, but yes, it did. Um, we did make, we did follow the CDC guidelines and we're complying with all the CDC guidelines. Um, and, and so as things change, our requirements will change also. Um, is the clinic on campus focusing mainly on older adults or is there pediatric opportunities? There are pediatric opportunities. Uh, it's, it's, it ranges, uh, yes, primarily adults and older adults, uh, but due to us also having the speech and language perspective, uh, we do see a fair amount of kids who need evaluations because of, of those aspects. We do get a fair amount of evaluations um, at different times in the year for auditory processing evaluations. So, so yes, there are pediatrics um, in there that we do see, but I will tell you, I'll be honest with you, yes, primarily is our adults and older adults, but there are pediatric and younger adults. Uh, we do have CI patients, cochlear implant patients, uh, so tinnitus patients, balance patients uh, for those, but by far it it's varies depending on, you never know. Um, I see all the tinnitus patients and um, last spring, uh, we started getting calls in the end of November and the December. And uh, from like the second week of the semester, there was attendance. I see them once a week. We're booked through like 10, 11 weeks of the semester. Wow. As the time started coming, unfortunately, people started canceling for one reason or another. And we ended up with only five that semester. You know, there are some semesters we have one. So, you know, this semester, we had one this past Monday, we have one this Monday, I have one the following Monday. So we have three so far. We don't know what's going to happen. So, um, Are the externships required to take place within a specific distance or mileage of the school um, in yes. the state? Yes, they are um, not so much much, but a time radius of two hours of Bloomsbury to try to keep people. Um, some people, some people, um, if they live at a different area, they want to move home. And what we recommend, they talk to the faculty responsible for that, because if you don't talk to them, they may place you someone somewhere where they think it's within two hours radius of Bloomsburg, and now you're driving four hours. Um, and we don't want that to happen. Plus, also, we want to make sure that we have enough sites in the area, because um, not everybody has agreements with us and not everybody wants to take students. So, so we need to make sure um, if you talk, if you go back home during those time periods, um, there's enough sites in there, but you got to keep in mind, you have to come back to class uh, campus for classes two days a week. So wherever it is, uh, but usually we try to keep it within two hours. 
Uh, Christian has asked, are there any clinical opportunities uh, dealing with patients who have special needs? Uh, off campus or on campus? He didn't specify. Um, okay. um, well, I'll answer in general. It, it really okay. depends on, 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 on the setting. We do have some special needs individuals come in. Um, you know, years ago, I evaluated uh, an individual with special with a fragile X. Um, so, so yes, uh, again, are we seeing majority? No, we do see some, and that also depends on where your placement is, uh, where, where you go. Uh, several years ago, we had, um, a student go to, we had students go to DuPont hospital in Delaware, and you see a lot of special needs. We had a student go to Kennedy Krieger, uh, down toward Maryland. And again, um, have seen a lot of special needs. So it depends on, on where you end up getting your placements. And, and that's just with even where you work. So. Yeah. It's yeah. a great question, Christian. Anybody else? I um, laughably started this event by saying this should last around 30, 35 minutes. Well, we're hour and 15. And that's because you guys have had phenomenal questions. This has yeah. been a, a great group. Yep. So really and, appreciate you all sticking with us. And, and I will say if, if at any time anyone has any questions about the program, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, my information's up there on the website. So you can um, reach out to me and say, hey, or I guess I could quickly type it in. So if people wanted it, not thinking of that. Uh, make sure I got it right. There we go. So, so there's my email if somebody uh, needs to reach out to me and has um, any additional questions you think of something after. Tom, and I had a final question for you. You are a Bloomsburg graduate, correct? Yes, yes, I am a Bloomsburg graduate. Um, came here through the undergraduate and got my master's here. Um, I went out and I, you know, started working in a private practice, actually with a retired uh, professor from a different university. And he said to me, you know, you have, you, you, you have what it takes to get a PhD. And I'm like, no. And he talked to me and I ended up going back and getting my PhD. Um, I started off at, at Columbia and um, what happened was the chair passed away and things kind of got out of control. So I left uh, Columbia and went down to NYU, finished up my work at NYU. And I will tell you um, that um, compared to students, it, and when I first went there, I was like, oh boy, little country boy from Bloomsburg going up against these Ivy League people, I'm gonna be blown out of the water and I was pleasantly surprised that I had a better core education than most of the people, if not all of them, um, going through the program. And, and uh, that is actually uh, my goal when I got back into academia. Uh, you know, I want to give students that same background foundation that I have. So wherever they, they go, they are confident and, and can go anywhere from here because they have a good solid core education yeah that's great husky for life yep any well i don't questions? see yeah i don't see any other uh questions in the q a so i just want to take a quick second to thank everybody for joining us um again i know this was kind of a marathon session but again it's just outstanding questions so we appreciate everybody's participation thank you dr zaleski uh for, for thank you uh, for putting on the presentation we would invite people to apply again the app deadline is february 1st but the earlier you apply the better if you have questions please do not hesitate to contact dr zaleski or myself we're happy to help in any way that we can and uh hope everybody has a great night and look forward to seeing you here on campus